The American Society on Aging was founded in 1954. 66 years later, people are living prosperous and longer lives. However, many are living with social and economic inequities and inequalities. And the pandemic, it has reminded us that this country doesn't embrace aging. What will happen in 10 years when one in five Americans will be over 65? The American Society on Aging is transforming itself to tackle the challenges and invest in the opportunities that this demographic change will bring. The new ASA reflects our year-long programming and meaningful membership experience. The new ASA reflects our commitment to unite, to empower, and to champion all of you. But most importantly, the new ASA reflects our optimism for the future of aging. On behalf of everyone at the American Society on Aging, I am proud to introduce you to the new ASA. Learn more and join us at www.asaging.org. Welcome everyone. I'm Ken Dykewald and I'm the host and moderator of the Legacy Interviews and you're about to encounter a truly extraordinary woman, human being and pioneer and continued leader in the field of aging. Dr. Jeanette Takamura earned her BA and MSW from the University of Hawaii and her PhD from the Heller School for Social Policy at Brandeis University. She's a professor and Dean Emerita of the Columbia University School of Social Work, where she served as the school's first female dean. During her tenure as dean, nine research centers were established, the majority with international or global concentrations. For that, from 1997 to 2001, she served as the United States Assistant Secretary for Aging, was appointed by President Clinton, worked alongside Dr. Donna Shalala. Among her many accomplishments, she established the National Family Caregiver Support Program as part of the Modernized Older Americans Act. Earlier, Jeanette was a practicing social worker serving youth and families and held university faculty positions and also held roles in Hawaii state government. She's the recipient of numerous awards, including the Lucy Stone Award from the White House the Order of the Rising Sun by Ambassador Nishimiya from Japan. And she was also named an exceptional social work pioneer by the National Association of Social Workers Foundation. Welcome, Jeanette Takamura. Thank you, Ken. You know, I think one of the things we haven't done is we haven't really acknowledged you. Oh. You're the guy who, you know, courageously, thoughtfully, innovatively always kind of took the path that other people oftentimes didn't. And you did that with incredible strength, courage, and, and just intelligence. I think you need to be acknowledged. So I actually wanted to interview you today. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you. Uh, and second of all, no, I'm interviewing you today. Uh, that's the way this is going to work. So look at before we jump into pages of questions that I've got, and because you've got so many interesting experiences and perspectives in your life. Uh, first, I'm going to throw up some pictures that we got from you and your family. And I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit about what we're looking at. So hold on. Here we go. All right. So all right. what is this a picture of? So that's a picture of my mother's family. And, you know, it looks like a lot of people, but there are hundreds. So this is just a small sliver of our family. All right. And before I put a circle around you, I want everybody to try to figure out which of those cute little ones <laughs> are you. And there you are. Right. And With my hair bow. <laughs> and your mom and dad are which of these folks? My mother is the third well, actually, the second woman from the left, and my father is the fourth man from the left. So he's not in the lighter sports jacket. No, he's, he's the, the one slightly right darker behind. one. Got it. Speaking of your dad, handsome man, and there's his cute little girl. Tell me about this relationship. 
So my dad was really special, Ken. I mean, my mother was too, but he lived to 103. Really? Uh, yeah. And what's so interesting about his family is that all but one of his siblings lived to their ninth decade. So this is a, you know, a family that has lived a long time. But what's so incredible about him is his forward thinking. He was kind of like a Ken Dykewald, but way back oh. when. A you know, private sector, really um, hardworking, innovative ideas, looked at what customers needed and really went after that for him, for them. But what I really appreciated about him was that he was forward thinking about girls and women. And so he always said to me, you can be anything you want to be, just go for it. Mm -hmm. And he also said something which I thought was really interesting. He said, don't ever rely on a man. <laughs> <laughs> really? <Yeah>. Wow. <laughs> I was like, what? You know, but I still remember him saying that. And all of my friends who got to know him became his friends and they just loved being with him. All right. So who's this attractive gang well, here? So that's my husband and my daughter. This is, of course, several decades ago. But I want you to think about the three of us versus that picture of my mother's family. Oh, interesting. Because in that first row were all the sisters who took care of their parents when they were frail. And think about the support group they had, because it wasn't just the sisters, it was the sisters' kids as well. So, you know, you're not even seeing the whole family. So when my grandmother became very frail, Everybody was available to her. Right. Now look at this. And this is the American family, right? Yep. We don't have all those relatives <clears throat> to on. So I wanted to share that because I thought the juxtaposition would be really thoughtful, thought-provoking. Well, here you yeah. are in the, in the halls of power. Scheming. <laughs> Scheming because we wanted to see the Older Americans Act passed and you know, we really wanted to raise the budget, which we were able to do. And we, we need to get the Older Americans Act reauthorized. We're so, going to talk about that. But this is, I guess, around 2000? Yeah, well, yeah, just before <clears throat> 2000. That's right. She was an amazing, amazing boss. So this picture, I believe, is in Jordan. That's right. And there you are, one right. of only two women at the table. But tell us about this. So this was a meeting with some Jordan officials, and we were talking about the kinds of programs that we could do in Jordan. And this is when, and even before then, actually it's my work in Japan that made me start to ask some questions about aging. And I hope we can get into that. We because will. I actually think that we may be working against ourselves in how we conceptualize aging and the challenges that come with it. So when I went international, I didn't talk about aging, Ken. I talked about longevity. Mm. And I'll talk about the difference between- All right, I'm gonna ask you that in the guts of the interview, but yeah. let's, so most of the people that I've talked to have been pretty much focused on the US, but here you are in Jordan and then here you are in Uganda. Right. Uganda, tell me about this. What were you doing there with these children? Well, we had a project that was just really quite unique, and it was probably the first of its kind, by one of our professors who was Ugandan himself. And he, was, he came from poverty, so he really wanted to do something for the kids to enable them to actually grow up and have an education. So I'm there with a group of children and people from the community essentially, again, going back to the concept of longevity, trying to ensure that generations of Ugandans would have the opportunity to age. So this was an incredible opportunity. Now, where are we here? What is this, what is this event taking place? Actually, I was, I was awarded the Order of the Rising Sun by the government of Japan. So this is in New York. Um, I, I was presented the award by Ambassador Nishimiya, who was an incredible, incredible diplomat. 
All right. And the last picture I've got, when I first saw it a couple of days ago, I thought, oh, this must be a mistake. But then <laughs> I heard, no, you really wanted this picture and you had That's an right. explanation. That's All right. All right. <laughs> what do we got? So oftentimes we look at things and think, oh, think, oh, this is a disaster. It's horrible. But someone sent me the picture and I looked at it and I thought, you know, it's really interesting. It sort of disrupts your thinking. And it occurred to me that it was actually like a flower. It's actually beautiful. So for me, it's, you know, it has a lot to do with perspective and meaning and what we attribute to things and call disasters instead of interesting opportunities. Lovely. We are, that will stick in my mind. So let's pull the pictures down and let's you and I jump into some, uh, some serious questions here. Sure. So you were born in 1947. That's right. Japanese parents in Hawaii right after a war. Did you feel as a child any discrimination being of Japanese descent? Yes and no. So let me tell you the yes and no. We lived in a primarily white community and the discrimination was very subtle. So um, I could feel it, but it wasn't necessarily spoken. On the other hand, in the general Hawaii community, that sort of sort of subtle discrimination wasn't really so apparent. And I, so I've had several different experiences. And one of them is that every weekend and every holiday, we went to my grandmother's home and all of the cousins were there. And so as a Japanese American child, we would go to the Obon Festival, which was down the block. We would also, you know, jump into the Ofuro, which is that hot tub, all the girls at once and then all the boys and so forth. And so I had a very sort of bifurcated experience growing up in the neighborhood in which I lived, which was again, primarily white, there was a little tinge of that, you know? But then in my everyday life in school, uh, you know, with my family, et cetera, no, not, you know, not any sense of it. Okay. So let me try to make some, let me try to give it some meaning, if you will. When I look at it, I feel like I've been blessed by many perspectives and my friends were, part native Hawaiian, Filipino, Chinese, white, you name it, mixed bag, okay? So I was able to learn how to navigate different environments. I wouldn't say that I really experienced overt discrimination until I went to the mainland. But, you know, by then I had built up this sort of store of tools and skills and behaviors and attitudes and mindsets that became very uh, helpful in being resilient. Wow. Um, so benefit to you that you see in having grown up with diversity baked into you. That's right. And help you develop capacity to navigate and to work with differences better than maybe other others of us have had yes, the experience. And, and I would add to that, Ken, that in Hawaii, there's an underlying concept and sort of ethos and everything. It's the aloha spirit. Okay, you question know? about that. I've been to Hawaii yeah. many times. Yep. And I always thought, oh, it just means hello or what's up or what's no. more than that, huh? Yeah, what, is, I, what does aloha mean? Aloha means really welcoming the other, of embracing the other, of finding commonalities, of you know, really looking at ourselves as one and the same. And aloha really is also about love. Mm. So in, in growing up, that was the predominant spirit that was there. So I didn't see my Chinese friends as different or my Filipino friends or my native Hawaiian friends or even my Caucasian friends. We ran around, Russell, Russell who's a white guy, <laughs> now is a white guy, uh, was my best friend. You know, we would run around together. And Tappy, who all lived on the other side of us, was another really <clears> good friend. So, you know, it was possible to integrate all of that. So we might all benefit from a little more of the Aloha spirit these I days. So. so I'm curious, 
what an interesting upbringing, interesting part of the world. There you go from Hawaii to Brandeis, and you focused on moving into the aging field. What turned you into the aging field? How did, what was that about? What well, drove that decision? You know, yeah, I think you know that um, Brandeis had a real cadre of leaders in aging policy. So I studied with one of them in particular, Dr. Robert Morris. And most students didn't want to study with him because he was really tough. Our first session had 30 students. The second session had about six. People dropped like flies because they were like terrified. And I decided to stay with him. He followed me for all of my career until he died. So, you know, he became a mentor and he became a confidant, uh, just wonderful. But I didn't focus on aging there. I focused on policy with an interest in aging. And the aging interest really didn't develop until I went back and went to the University of Hawaii. Well, before that, actually. Wait, I heard a rumor that somehow there were people had to designate an area they wanted to pursue and yeah. because your name was at the end of the alphabet. That's right. Some, so tell actually, me that story. Is that true, that story? Yeah, that's true. So when I was getting my master's degree, uh, we had a course that we had to all take. It was required. And you had to sign up for an age segment that you wanted to study. So I was the last person to sign up. And other students had taken infants, children, middle-aged adults, et cetera. And I'm there like, just aging. <laughs> so I signed up for it. And we were supposed to write a 20-page paper. But I wrote a paper that was 120 pages long that my professor then used to teach the course. So, you know, the interest was peaked. And then when I went to Brandeis, I studied with Dr. Robert Morris. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here you are, social worker, academic, policy person. You become the United States Assistant Secretary for Aging, which is sort of unbelievable. Um, yeah. Did you battle hard to get that job? No, it's a very strange story. I got called twice for it. The first time was when actually Fernando got the job, which is great because I, when I got the call, my secretary said, um, the Clinton you know, White House is on, on the phone. And I said, right, and Mickey Mouse is on the other line from Disney. <laughs> she said, no, I'm serious. I said, right, I'm serious too. So I picked up the phone and it was the personnel office of the White House. And they talked to me and said, you know, would you be willing to be considered? And I said, give me three days to think about it. So I said, I called them back in three days and I said, I'm going to respectfully decline because my daughter was too young, you know? And anyway, I thought there was somebody who would be perfect for the position. And of course it was Fernando. And I actually said, you really need to talk to Fernando Torres Gill. And they did. And I'm sure they had him in mind anyway, you know? So when they called the second time, I thought, well, how often does this happen twice, right? So I talked to them and I thought this will never happen, whatever, you know, and just went on with my life. Meanwhile, I'm talking to Donna Shalala and she's asking me about coming to be assistant secretary. And I, at one point I just gave up because both were asking me questions, the White House and Donna. And I said, can't you guys get your act together? I'm answering the same questions twice. And she said, what? <laughs> so she said, this is wonderful, Jeanette. There'll be concurrence. What lucky, I... for, lucky for us. So I've got a question. There's a lot of discussion in the last 24 months about supporting caregivers. Now, it's a topic we've all been tuned into for a long time, anybody in the field. But you really were kind of the pioneer by causing this caregiving theme to be a part of the Modernize Older Americans Act. What were you thinking back 20 years ago that that became such an important theme? Well, always the notion that my mother's family had so many people to help out was always there in my DNA almost. But to be really honest with you, Ken, that was the fallback, the fallback um, 
you know, uh, program in my mind. When I was in Hawaii, we actually developed a whole package around long-term care. We developed a, a state long-term care financing program that would have covered everybody in the state. It's like Washington Cares, they just passed that. But that was in 1989 that we came out with an actuarially sound long-term care financing proposal. And this program over the last 30 years would have covered people in Hawaii for long-term care. So it makes me sick to think we couldn't get it through. Mm. But that was just one piece. The other thing we did is a, a two year long television series on long-term care. And that was to educate the Hawaii public. The third thing that we did is set up a training program through the community college to train individuals interested in starting aging businesses in how to be an entrepreneur. And then we set up a trust fund that would help underwrite the initial expenses of people who were interested in being entrepreneurs. And finally, we put together a program that was a multilingual telephone access line that answered questions that anyone could raise from across the country. The answers were pre-recorded. They were about social security, aging, long-term care, Medicare, Medicaid, you name it, you know, elder abuse, all of that. So we got calls from all across the country. Wait, so you were doing this, you were envisioning this, not just dreaming it up, but you were setting in motion solutions more than a quarter of a century ago. That's Has right. It has it, how much frustration do you feel right now that America is still behind the curve on this Lots issue? Lots of frustration. Lots of frustration. I mean, in going international, I see what other countries are doing. I was at a conference in Japan and I was invited to be the US you know, representative, right? Um, and I had to really carefully say to them, that in the particular area they were interested in, the US was not a leader. I didn't quite see it that way. But, you know, Denmark and Germany were way ahead of us. And so, yes, I have a lot of frustration about that. Uh, when I think about the people who could have been covered for their long term care, you know, expenses, it makes me want to cry. Let me keep so. pressing into your career and your early years because there's so much to cover and you're such a remarkable. Uh, adventurer in many ways. So there you are. Now you become a professor at really kind of the, the vortex of it all, Columbia University. And not only that, you become the first female dean. How hard did you work to get that job? So Ken, all of the jobs that I took, I didn't apply for. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the secret. Really? Serious, yes, seriously. So they had heard about me and called, and I actually said to them, I'm not interested. <laughs> and it was partly because I was trying to get back to the West, you know, of the West Coast. And New York sounded awfully far East. But my friend said to me, you like to shop, just go for the interview. It's New York, you know. So I went for the interview and I told them whatever I thought they needed to do. I was perfectly candid. I always am in job interviews. And so they, you know, I, and, I, and I was pretty candid. I said, I'm really not looking for this job. So I'm going to tell you what I think you need to do. And so then I got a call from the provost and he said, well, we've narrowed it down to one person. I said, great, good luck to that person. And he said, it's you. And I said, oh, oh my God, you're in big trouble. <laughs> anyway. All right. So, so help me out. Here yeah. you are. You're in New York, which in addition to, as you mentioned, there's good shopping. Yeah. You got a serious responsibility in front of you now, right. which is to create a concept for what the future of people coming through that program. And since Columbia is the, in many ways, the model for other universities around the world, what did you hope to accomplish as dean? Right. I was really clear about the goals. I wanted to globalize the school. And so in 2003, we launched our first effort to do that. And I also wanted to be sure that all of our work was evidence-based, that's research. 
I also wanted to be sure that we brought into the school a very strong dimension of diversity. So I hired a lot of diverse faculty and put emphasis on that. And that was not easy. It really was not easy. Why not? So, well, it wasn't easy because frankly, you know, the pipeline wasn't clear for one thing. Lots of scholars were intimidated by Columbia. So, you know, even the best that I tried to recruit sometimes backed away because they weren't sure they could get tenure. Tenure at Columbia is really tough to get. One out of, one out of, was it three out of 10 people get <clears throat> tenure. So seven tend to fall by the wayside. So the other goal I had was to tenure people, to really make sure that I made the process clear and fair. And we were able in the time that I was dean to get about 10 people tenured, which is pretty remarkable. So, talk, talk to me about what it was like to not only be a dean, and uh, undersecretary on aging, but also to be a woman. I mean, you have achieved these ascendancies and these positions of influence during a very interesting time in history where the role of women and the power of women is in massive shifts. What's, massive shifts. what's your take on, the, on how America, let's start, uh, yeah. has come to the right level of respect or regard to power of women? We're not quite there, Kim. If you look at the reports on closing the gender gap, for example, by the World Economic Forum, they issued one in just this year. And it's real clear that the US has a long way to go. There are 156 nations that they looked at and we rank 30. You know, so I really, in terms of gender equity, so I really think we have a lot, a long ways to go. What do you mean by gender equity? Well, when we look at things like health security, which we're doing not that great on, um, educational attainment, we're doing great, and so are most of the other countries in the world. Political engagement, terrible. We could be doing a lot better. Do you mean the political government, leaders as women or voters or activists? Women? Well, women in leadership positions, okay, actively engaged in political life. But we also don't have a lot of women in the C-suite. So, you know, there are things that we still need to work hard on. The good news is there have been some breakthroughs. Me Too and other movements have, I think, created a new landscape for women all around the world. So in Japan, there's Shutu. You know, women don't want to wear high heels anymore in the workplace. And other countries have their equivalents. So we're beginning to see the emergence of a landscape that will enable women to be equal partners. Now, let me just say that I think that women have not been equal partners. They've carried most of the load of <laughs> the acknowledgement. Now, seriously, think about it. How do you get to longevity? How do you get to age? Well, you have to have a mother who can feed you, care for you, support you while you're in school. And then if you go further, who's running the household and who's taking care of older people? It's women. So it's on the backs of women that we have made progress. And it's time for women to take leadership roles and also importantly, to be acknowledged. Now, where can this happen? Certainly in the political arena, but I'm a believer not just in individual leadership, I think organizations are profoundly important. That if you can transform organizations, you can begin this, you know, this chain effect of transforming society. So I think we need to look within organizations and see what are we doing in order to enable ourselves to get to equity along many different lines. You know, if I could piggyback just a little bit on your comment several years ago, my wife and I and our kids, we did that once in a lifetime trip to Africa on safari and we're in Kenya outside of Nairobi and what we were what I was struck by is that I've grown up with the myth of the lion you know the lion king doing the lion share and yet when you get out on the savannah the lions just goof off and nap all day long the lionesses do the hunting the lionesses raise the children it's like the lionesses rule Africa not the lions yes why do you think 
why do you think the culture has been so twisted to not fully appreciate the role of women? You're a woman of 73 years and you've seen a lot. What's up? What's wrong with us? Well, I think there are lots of things, Ken. I mean, first of all, we really need to talk to some anthropologists to give us the really historical roots of hunting and gathering and who needed to go out and, you know, get the meat and who was actually tending the field and the babies and so forth. So there are long-term historical roots, but I think that we've perpetuated that. And one of the things that I'm really passionate about is thinking of the world as socially constructed, that all of the things that we hold as truths are actually assumptions that we've reinforced in our interaction with each other. Give me an example. Yeah. In a, so, give me an example in the aging world. So in aging, we assume that women are gonna be the caregivers. That is just the assumption, but that's socially constructed. It comes out of men and women over long periods of time, buying into that social agreement by giving women the role of caregiver and all the meanings attached to it and giving men the role of the wage earner or whatever and all the meanings attached to it, which has so many, you know, so many ripple effects to that. So women aren't supposed to be in the workplace, they're supposed to be at home. Men are supposed to be in the workplace, they're not supposed to be caregivers. So that comes through a series of agreements that are reinforced by our interactions with each other. When I look at men of the younger generation, not all of them have those assumptions anymore. So if you interact with them, you know, they're coming from a slightly different place. And the more that interaction occurs, And the more we reinforce that, we construct a new reality. So I believe a lot in how we use language, you know, the terms that we use can empower, disempower. If you just take a check in your body of your reactions to certain things, let me give you an example. Raw fish, poke, do you have a different reaction? (laughs) I did. Yeah. First of all, I love sushi, so I can go with it however it's called. But yeah, but raw fish gives me a different picture in my mind than tuna poke, for example. Let me use another one as an example. And and this one, please understand that I'm using a charged term and I totally, I'm totally using it to be illustrative. Okay. So we can say someone is hapa. Do you know what hapa means? Mm-mm. Half, half Japanese, half white, half this and half that. Okay, so that to me is a more neutral term because people don't know it yet. But mm-hmm. as we use it, we can see that in po- a positive light because it's not used a lot yet. Let's stay on, can we stay on words for a second? Let's stay in the aging field. And I've sure. got so many questions to ask you. I'm gonna keep charging forward. All right, good. So. Do you think, so there's a lot of words that that are floating about elderly, elder, older adult, senior, senior citizen, which, where do you gravitate in terms of your own identity? You think of yourself as a senior citizen? No, absolutely not. I don't like any of them, (laughs) to be quite (laughs) honest with you. You know, I'm just this person, right? Mm -hmm. With lots of commitments and lots of passion about different things. In Hawaii, instead of saying senior citizen, when you're younger, you're sister. When you're older, you're auntie. And so mm. you know you've crossed the line when all of a sudden the clerks say auntie. <laughs> mm. yeah. So question for you. You have, and you do it with a smile, but you know, if I were to, if there would be an aging field Wikipedia thought leader, it ought to have your picture there. So you have been a leader of thought for your whole life. Where do you draw the strength for that? You know, because I'm sure you bang into walls and you bang into jerky attitudes and you bang into non not people unwilling to grow. Yep. Where do you draw the strength to be a warrior? Well, several places. I mean, number one, I love to read widely. I don't just read aging stuff. I read all kinds of things. And because I teach younger people, I'm pretty up on contemporary culture. But additionally, remember now, my father told me, don't be held back because you're a woman. 
The other thing is I have very, I mean, I really have to say this. I believe in the strength of organizations and in the strength of teams. And if you can assemble a really good team around you, like Robin and Elizabeth for you, <laughs> you know, you can do just about anything. It's good teamwork that does it. Okay, let's stay on the idea of effectiveness. Um, if you were to lay out, what, is, what does it take if somebody wants to be a leader, let's say in this Asian field or whatever field? Sure. What are the characteristics of leadership that works? Well, I would hope that the person has some self-awareness because I think some of the worst leaders are people who have no clue about themselves and how they impact others. But I also think leaders really need to have a vision because otherwise you become a caretaker. You know, you're there kind of moving the widgets. But, you know, what I try to do with my students is I try to give them an opportunity to really become leaders with vision. And so it just, I was shocked a few weeks ago when in a meeting, one of my students from about 12 years ago said, I still remember the class, Dr. Takamura, when you asked us, you challenged us, and you said, if we're in policy, then at the end of every day, we need to answer one question. What have you done to make America better for its people today? So, you know, it's like, you're not just moving a widget. What are you concretely doing to impact the lives of people? So I think vision is necessary. I also think really being up on the literature is necessary. But I think with self-awareness, you've got to really look at what are you really trying to do? What are you really trying to accomplish? And how much of that is really public impact versus personal impact? So I think all of that's really, really important. And again, I go back to assemble a good team and know how to finance your dreams. Because hmm. if you don't know how to budget, you ain't gonna get it. <laughs> all right, so now we're gonna go behind the curtain on this leadership point. When you look back over the last 50 years of your leadership, what are you most proud of? Well, I think I'm proud of several things. Um, I'm proud of the National Family Caregiver Support Program and the fact that I stepped away from it because frankly, I don't believe in hanging on to things. I think you gotta plant the seed and let it bloom, let it grow. I'm also really proud of that package we put together in Hawaii the only part of it that didn't get through is the financing piece, which I really <laughs> wanted. You know? But otherwise, you know, it all went through. I'm proud of having built the school and, you know, the nine research centers and tenured all the faculty and created diversity. So lots of things. And I'm most proud of what I have, I think, tried to do in a very earnest way. So all of the above. Fantastic. We're gonna turn into the subject of aging and the field of aging, because there are people, thousands of people actually, now and in the months ahead from all over the world who are tuning into this, these sessions. So let me ask a simple question that might be foundational, sure. which is in this modern era, I don't mean the 1970s or the 1990s, I mean now, the third decade of the 21st century, what's the ideal role of an anti? or of an older adult, or of an elder, whatever we call these, these sure. folks, including us. What, what sure. should older people be in society? What's their role? So my glib answer is, be whomever you want. Do whatever you want. But my personal answer would be more along the lines of this, that we only have a period of time left in our lives. <clears throat> the big question is, if you're really committed to global you know, climate change or equity or whatever, take a look at realistically what you can accomplish during the time that you might have on this earth. And understand that probably the most important thing you can do is to find the others who will carry forth the struggle and make sure that things are materialized so that this world of ours is really a better place. So at a dinner party recently, I said, my commitment is to finding others who can carry forth and to support them so that they can fight the good fight and make the world a place that we all want it to be. Because this is the only spaceship 
you and I will probably be on. Maybe Jeff Bezos and others have other options, but we have this singular spaceship. So we got to make sure that it works. Do you feel the field of aging, which interestingly is probably more heavily populated by folks in the social work space right. than housing or faith or fitness or travel or all sorts of things. Um, if you were to recraft the field of aging, having learned what you've learned, what would you have there be less of and what would you have there be more of going forward? Yeah. Well, I think that I have to go back to language. I mean, I really would prefer that we use longevity as the term because it's more aspirational. We want to live. And again, if you look at your body and how you feel when you hear longevity versus aging, aging sort of makes you feel pulled down. But longevity gives you a sense that there's a horizon there and that it's not just your longevity, but the longevity of others. So I would start by really taking a look at our languaging and how we disempower ourselves or empower the field. I think that there's a lot of good stuff going on, certainly with you know, tech development and the sciences, great things going on. I also think that we're at a very interesting intersection in terms of just the world and the US and how we move forward. Um, I, I think there's more intersectional stuff. We're becoming aware of the importance of gender, of race, of ability, et cetera. So it's no longer underneath, it's, it's above the surface. So uh, we're a capitalistic democracy as well as all sorts of things. But in my 47 years now in the aging field, it's the population of people who come to conferences and meetings and say they've devoted their life are overwhelmingly people who work in the not-for-profit or government side. Right. Should the field be more inclusive of folks who make bathroom grab bars or who design automobiles or who are involved in media creation? Absolutely. Or do you think the field ought to steer clear of the for-profit folks? No, no, no. I always admired your willingness to pioneer. And I've always appreciated the fact that you were willing to give voice to aging issues in a totally different domain because it shouldn't be just one domain. If we're gonna cross the finish line in a good way for the country and for ourselves individually, we need the technology. In fact, I think the next few decades is gonna be all about the technology that enables people to live without feeling disabled, to live full out with you know, all of their capacity and their talent and their skills being brought to bear because of the supportive technology that will have been made available. Okay, so I want an honest answer to this. Yeah. At what age do you think people get old? You know, I think it's a real mental thing. I think it's how you see the world and how you engage in the world. I don't see myself as 74. I really don't. You know, my... You know, my body might sometimes feel that way, but even that's like, what are you doing? You know, you're supposed to be working better or whatever. So I don't really see that. And partly it's because of what I include in my life and in my world. You know, I'm not like listening to Lawrence Welk or whomever. I like Queen and I like BTS. And, you know, I like that stuff and I genuinely do. So. For me, aging, now, do you like BTS because you think they're cute or because they're from Korea or you like their music? I like their music. <laughs> I, I sometimes wonder about their appearance, although I kind of think, you know, gee, I'd like their makeup artist, whoever it is. <laughs> <laughs> You're very funny. So do you think the age 65 should be the anchor point for when people say, OK, I've now crossed the line into old age? That's a hard one. Can because those people who are in blue collar jobs oftentimes put their bodies at great risk. And so they experience disability a lot earlier than those of us who are you know, in offices. So aging is really different. And it, it's sort of defined by a lot of demographic variables, you know, whether you are one race or another, the socioeconomic status, you know, your your employment status, et cetera, access to healthcare. If you don't have access to healthcare, 
you're not going to feel real young for real long, you know? So you're describing a person's <clears throat> functional abilities or their needs. That's right. You're not saying that that all happens on your 65th no, birthday for everybody. absolutely not, right. Why do you think ageism, ageism is still so prevalent? You know, I've known you a long while. There's a lot of people we've been talking about ageism. You know, Bob Butler in 1968 talked about it as a psychiatric disorder, gerontophobia. Yeah. Why is it so prevalent still? Why have we allowed it? Well, I think, you know, again, very complicated answer. I, I know we don't have the time to get into it, but um, the way that we structure our world is, tends to be dichotomous. You know, either you're young or you're old, either you're rich or you're poor. And so we've bought into that and we've permitted that. And I think we sometimes actually perpetuate that. Do you feel a victim as a 73, 74 year old woman of ageism? Do you feel in any way that you're being pushed off to some other category of less worth? No, but now that you've told the whole world how old I am. Well, no, you said it a couple of minutes ago. So I just said you were born in 47. So, but do you, well, that's an interesting issue. Do you feel comfortable talking about your age or would you rather it be something that's people don't? I talk about my age, mm -hmm. you know, I do, but I'm just, I was just kidding you a few minutes ago. All right. So, yeah. But do you feel, do you feel less respected or less perceived as valuable as you have aged? Some people certainly do treat me that way, but that's not, you know, generally the case. So yeah, I mean, mixed bag. So a question for you. Um, there's a lot of people who signed up for these programs, watching this session, who were young professionals. There are those who are in their 50s or 70s or older, but there's folks in their 20s and right. 30s. What advice, if there were one or two pieces of advice you would give to a young person who wanted to be a change maker, in the field of aging, what would you guide them to do or be? Yeah, I think what I would say to them is, you know, they really need to look at why they have that passion, whether it's about self-promotion or whether it's about really trying to address an issue. I gravitate towards people who are interested in making changes occur because they have an earnest desire around an issue. I gravitate away from people who are, as I, as I experience them, more interested in self-promotion. So I would say people need to be really clear about who they are and what they really want to accomplish. Because ultimately it comes up, you know? And other than that, I would say like, learn everything you can, absorb everything you can, test your ideas out, remain in conversation, you know, and don't step away, don't give up. If there's one area having to do with longevity that you think, whoa, we better really get smarter about and make some changes, what would that be? Women. Say more. I think we really need to take a look at the status of women in society because they are the ones who are living longer. They're also the ones that are supporting every, every component of our society. Would you say that with the challenges pertaining to aging people, aging women or longevous women, that the aging field is succeeding at addressing the right issues or would you say it's failing? I think the aging field is so broad that you see successes in certain places, you see lags in others. And so much of that is determined by funding, Ken. You know, people who have ideas sometimes don't have the resources to back their good ideas. And that goes for research. It goes for all kinds of different things. So my hope is that as we look ahead, we really truly look ahead at where the significant breakthroughs can come and offer that, you know, support. So I'm, I occasionally wander into some of the more kind of outrageous territories of what is now being called geroscience. 
And I, I was in a meeting yesterday where people were talking about within a decade or two, it will become more common that folks are living to 120 or 150, a kind of super longevity. Right. I'm not sure how I feel about that. How do you feel about that? You think that we're ready for that world? Um, I think we need to get ready for that world. You know, I shared that with my mother when she was alive and she said, I really am not interested in that. And I said, well, why not, mom? And she said, well, I don't want to look like a prune. <laughs> so, but, you know, she wasn't accounting for the evolution of cosmetics and plastic surgery and all those good things that, you know, some people take advantage of. All right, now we're going to go into a few, I'm going to hit you with a few rapid fire, very personal right. questions, because you were a thought leader and an innovator and a pathfinder pertaining to aging and longevity when you were a young woman. Now you're in your eighth decade of life, as am I. So a couple of questions. Um, for you personally, has aging been an ascent or has it been a descent? It's been a centering. Whoa. Say more about that. It's the first time anyone yeah. has said that. <laughs> Come on, explain. Yeah there, things, explain. yeah, there are things that I realize that I know now and things that I realize I don't know, things that I realize I really am passionate about and things that I don't care about, you know? So it's given me an opportunity to sort of filter through my life and to also become much more accepting of myself. And, you know, I haven't done this alone. I mean, I've done this with learning meditation and, you know, doing a lot of fitness stuff, et cetera. But I feel much more balanced and much more centered. I'm clear about what priorities are or not. Has that clarity evolved over the decades or were you always clear? People think I was always clear, but, <laughs> you know, but I think it's evolved. I really do. And the breakthrough came with sort of the, the breakthrough with people understanding the benefits of meditation. Interesting. So somehow mindfulness, meditation, yeah. balancing has right. become a core part of your glide path. Right. Do you work to not age at all? Do you battle it? In terms of, you mentioned your mom not wanting to look like a prune. Yeah. Do you concern yourself with, with, I notice you've let your hair be its natural color. COVID uh, did that to me. <laughs> explain what went on in your mind around that. Well, you know, to be honest with you, I've wanted to do this for years because I'm highly allergic. And when COVID happened, I decided, forget this already. I'm just going to go natural, you know? So I've run into people who walk right by me. <laughs> they haven't, you know, they didn't recognize me, but you know, that's good sometimes. And it's interesting other times. Okay. So in your life so far, <clears throat> and tell us your dad lived to 103 during an earlier era, you might make it a lot of years. Um, what philosophy or story or book or fable or what is what sort of is the guiding one for you what do you, is it your faith what do you turn to for kind of to recharge or to reset when you're yeah. going through a difficult time i think it's all the lessons my mother and father taught me interesting also faith you know i'm a christian but i'm not a practicing well i am a practicing christian but not one who attends church let me put it that way um, and, you know, a lot of what I learned in social work, to be honest with you, really has been very meaningful in my life as well. You know, the notion of getting to know who you are, really, and of being much more aware of your impact on others, uh, all of that sort of came together for me, or is, continues to come together for me. So I'm going to use a word that may be a useful word, may not. The, the wisdom word, <clears throat> that there are some folks who believe that as you circle the sun, as you have 70 something times, you have the opportunity, it's not a guarantee to grow wiser. Do you think of yourself as wiser than the younger Jeanette Takamura? 
Well, let me say definitely. Um, for one thing, you know, um, I remind myself that I don't need to worry the, the details sometimes. I did when I was younger. Um, so yeah, definitely, much wiser. Do you think of yourself as retired? No, absolutely not. Whoa, whoa, you didn't even <clears throat> hesitate on that answer. You got a problem with retirement? No, I think it's wonderful. Most of my friends <laughs> are. I'm sort of the, you know, the deviant here. <laughs> But they say to me, you'll never retire. You wouldn't know what to do if you retired. So they say, so keep working. <laughs> you, if, when you work now, and before we began recording this, we had to make a change in your computer because you were getting emails and they were making a bleeping sound, but they were coming in every like two seconds. Right. So you are still very actively engaged in all sorts of things. Do you yeah. think that people are seeking you out for what reason? Well, interestingly, for a lot of checking in on what they should be doing, what their options really are, advice. I have a number of former students who said, I just started a job and I really need to talk with you about how I should take this one on. So I said, can you wait for uh, until after the interview that I have to do? <laughs> and then we'll, we'll spend some time. But I have a lot of former students who have reached out and said, you know, need your help. So this word mentor, <clears throat> you relate to that idea? Yeah. Role Absolutely. model, mentor? Absolutely. All right, so there's not been a lot of discussion about what's the kick that you get out of being a mentor? I can imagine how somebody who's being mentored by you would benefit, but what's the nourishment for you in doing it? Two things. For those who have been my students and for those who I've worked with, I see them as the soldiers who can help make the world a better place. So anything that I can do to support that, that for me is really worthwhile. On a more personal level, I just never realized this, but I have quite a number of people who have stopped me. I don't even know who they are. And they said, thank you. Said, for what? <laughs> who are you? You know, mm -hmm. I don't say the who are you part, but for what? And it turns out that I have said things like to women in particular, make sure you're in a job that pays you benefits. Make sure that you, know, you have the following kinds of things because in your older years, it's gonna matter. And if you should need to become a caregiver, then you need to bear the following in mind. And several of them have come back and said, thank you so much for telling me that. As a result of that, I got a financial planner. I feel like I'm secure now. And I've had students come back and say the same thing. So I never teach my courses as, as if it's just an academic endeavor. I also include things that, and I tell them, this is not about an academic subject. This is about you and your life and hmm. how it impacts you, your family, and your life. Okay, so two quick last questions, important sure. ones. First, I want you to time travel with me. Imagine that you, Today's Jeanette Takamura can go all the way back and sit with the 20 year old young Jeanette Takamura. Right. What would you tell her about what's in front of her in this life? I would say life happens, <laughs> go with it, do the best you can, and make sure that you feel good about what you're doing. Thank you. And my last question, I want you to imagine now we're going to time travel into the future. It's decades from now. Uh, I'm gone. You're gone. All the interview folks in this series are no longer alive. What is it you'd like for people to say and remember about Jeanette Takamura? She was? Well, more than she was, I think she loved her family and her friends and gave it all full out, put it all on the table for whatever she pursued. Well, here's what I'd like to say, that um, your framing leadership and forthrightness and humanity in terms of self-awareness and vision and teamwork and collaboration and global and tolerance is, uh, and your playfulness, and you're putting it all on the court, as they say, 
uh, are extraordinary. And, and for me, the, the honor of being in your presence and, and, and hearing your views and hearing what sense you make of it all. And I just want to say thank you for all that you are and all that you do and for being my friend. Well, I need to thank you, Ken, for all that you are and all that you've done and for taking the road less traveled so often. Kudos to you. Be well, my friend. Aloha. Yeah, aloha. <laughs> <laughs>